Okay, well, I think we'll make a, a start. So welcome everybody. Um, I can see there's over a hundred of you um, in the audience. So a really big welcome to you. Um, and the, the wonderful thing about this is you can be joining us from any part of the world, which is very, very obvious from those that are putting messages in the chat box. So um, welcome, my name's Ian. So welcome to this um, webinar, which is hosted by CatKind, um, supported um, very, we're very grateful to support we've got my cat care um, um, for this evening's webinar. Um, CatKind, as you're probably all aware, um, is, is a conglomeration of a number of different charities based in the UK. Um, the main purpose of which is to encourage what we're calling early neutering or prepubertal neutering in cats. Um, we're very aware that probably about 70% of um, uh, pregnancies in cats are unplanned. Um, and if only people would start um, neutering cats at four months old um, or earlier, if necessary, then um, we could avoid a lot of those pregnancies. Um, so tonight, hopefully, um, and we look very much looking forward to being able to discuss um, what some of the obstacles are. Um, it, you may well already be doing this and you come for a refresher, but uh, otherwise, if um, you're a veterinary professional and you're not already neutering cats at four months, we hope very much tonight you might be persuaded to give it a go, um, share this video, it will be recorded, um, share this knowledge um, with your wider team, and maybe have a go at, at starting to do cats at an earlier age and avoid some of those unwanted pregnancies. Um, I work for the Scottish SBCA, and I can say from first hand, there's never been a, a greater need for this. Um, there's an, an absolute abundance of unwanted cats in the UK currently. Um, shelters are absolutely full of cats. Uh, Rehoming them is becoming increasingly difficult, and there are lots and lots of kittens. So hope very much this is very relevant, and um, hope today we're going to dispel some myths. Um, shortly, we're going to hear from David um, from the RSPCA um, and Kate, who is a, a, a student at Nottingham University. Um, but before that, we're going to hear from Jenny from Cats Protection. However, just before I introduce her and, and let her take over, um, I can see that many of you are putting messages in the chat uh, box, which you're very welcome to do. However, if you have a question, um, we will be, be um, collating questions and hopefully have a time at the end to answer those questions. If you use, use the Q&A function at the bottom, please, that would be wonderful. Um, uh, Ellen and Nat in the background will be collating those questions and at the end we'll hopefully get, get through as many of those as we possibly can. I'm sure there'll be some burning questions by then. Um, otherwise, I am going to now hand over to Jenny, who is from Cats Protection, and she's going to give us a little bit of background as to what some of the old obstacles are and stumbling blocks that um, that she and her team have discovered um, in, in some of the research they've done. So um, sit back, relax, and enjoy what Jenny's got to say. That's great. Thank you, Ian. Just while the slides are coming up, um, just want to reiterate a, a, a massive thank you to everyone for attending today. It's really exciting to see so many people here, not at all nerve wracking at all. Um, I'm Jenny McDonald. I'm the feline epidemiologist at Cats Protection. I sit within the feline welfare research team and part of my role is to undertake scientific population studies um, and to uh, understand them in more detail and the interventions around them, such as uh, neutering cats and prepubertal neutering. Uh, at Cats Protection, we support neutering cats from four months of age. For all the reasons that Ian's just gone through, um, our shelters are, are, there's always waiting lists for shelter space and, and it is increasingly um, getting worse at the moment. Um, there's also, um, aside from those massive population benefits, are individual benefits to owners and their cats and their cats' welfare to prevent those unplanned litters. As Ian mentioned, 70% of all owned cat litters are accidental and the majority of those are happening within juvenile cats. Um, con um, so despite the four months being the recommended neutering age actually is not being practiced consistently and we really want to try and understand why that may be the case so we can best support vets, uh, look into the evidence, uh, the training materials, resources uh, to better be able to understand um, what are the needs of the veterinary profession on this issue to um, help cat more cats and improve their welfare. 
So with that in mind, in 2020, we undertook a cross-sectional survey of UK practicing veterinary surgeons, and we found that approximately 70% were comfortable with um, neutering at four months of age, and over half were recommending it for owned cats. So there is a lot of support um, for neutering cats at this age. However, for vets that carry it out and those that, that don't, there was um, a lot of contrast in beliefs on very similar themes. So if we take general anaesthetic and surgical risks, for example, the vets that were familiar with this procedure really viewed it positively um, and, and really highlighted the benefits of, of, of um, the protocols around that. However, vets that weren't familiar with those um, protocols had concerns around the trickiness of the surgery and the safety of the surgery as well. Additionally, we find that vets that aren't familiar with the procedure or not recommending it are quite concerned about having that conversation with a cat owner and, and worried about their reaction. Whereas for vets that are carrying it out, that doesn't seem to, didn't come out of the study as an issue at all. And actually that it was a, a much more beneficial uh, suggestion for age because owners are really engaged with their kitten. They're hopefully engaged with the vet at that point with their vaccination. So it's really great to keep up the, that momentum um, and booking for neutering um, following that vaccine schedule. And we also find different views on the wider vet profession. So for vets that were carrying it out, they're much more likely to just assume that it's standard practice to neuter at four months and unaware that um, a, a, a certain number of people are still neutering at six months and, and vice versa for those neutering at six months of age, very much um, more likely to think that that is the norm. And that result really highlights the importance of within practice experience and peers in shaping perceptions around this procedure. So if we um, focus a little bit more on the key concerns, asks and barriers from those that do not routinely carry out four month neutering, what we find is five overarching themes. Firstly, around size and development, um, concerns around a lack of evidence and the long term impact on individual cats. Now, whilst all studies have their limitations, there is quite a lot of evidence out there. So firstly, um, it did highlight perhaps there's a, a lack of accessibility to some of this evidence. Um, consequently, we have got a summary of evidence on our CatKind website that um, summarises all the peer review uh, um, in papers that are already available. And generally what it finds is that neutering cats prepubertally um, has similar effects on um, uh, behavioural development and physical development as neutering cats at that six months of age. There was no significant difference between the four versus six month neutering there. Um, there were obviously further concerns around the anaesthetic and analgesia protocols and surgical protocols. Um, as I just mentioned, these were not raised by vets that were familiar with those procedures. Um, and the main topic of the rest of the webinar will be focusing on some of these and dispelling some of these myths and concerns. And um, briefly, just to go back to that lack of compliance from owners or colleagues and a lack of com a confidence to make the case around prepubertal neutering, we do have a lot of resources on CatKind that can help enable um, enable uh, vet veterinary professionals to have that conversation. And we do have a video resource on there as well that demonstrates having that conversation um, with a cat owner also. So I'd recommend to um, look into that. And as I mentioned, actually, from the vets that are carrying this out, that hasn't come up as a, an issue today in our research. And finally, there was a concern around the lack of applicability to their practice, mainly that perhaps, you know, neutering earlier isn't a problem, in, uh, isn't it? isn't required in that area because there's not an overpopulation problem. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight a, a few points. We actually looked, uh, done a spatial analysis of those that carried out four month neutering, and we don't see any geographical differences in the loca locality. So it isn't a driving factor for those vets that are carrying it out. And I also just wanted to mention that um, cat owners, cats, they're not constrained to the vicinity of a veterinary practice or, or the, um, and the, and the veterinary practices aren't seeing all of the cats within a certain area. So that consistency in messaging, which obviously translates into consistency in the availability of this preventative um, healthcare procedure is really important um, because cats and owners are, are, are not constrained to different geographical locations. Um, also, we have quite high neutering rates within the UK, and I and that can sometimes bring with it a false sense of security when actually underpinning these um, high prevalence of neutering uh, is a lot of variation, and one of which is that age of neutering. And we've recently published a modelling study that finds that even if you have really high neutering rates, that if most of those cats aren't neutered prepubertally, if they've 
uh, they're allowed to reach potential breeding age, that can still have a really important influence on the unknown population and put in demand on our shelter populations also. Um, just finally, just to again signpost to cat kind, we're continually continually reviewing the evidence, and as Ian mentioned, it is a massive collaboration across um, animal welfare charities. Um, so we're we're constantly looking to improve upon those resources on there. And um, so please visit cat kind following today's webinar if you want to find out more. However, I'm now going to hand over to David and Kate, who will be talking through the procedure and dispelling some of those concerns um, and uncertainties around the protocols. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jenny, for giving that important clinical context to the, the, the cat overpopulation problem. Um, have we got the slides, please? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is David Yates. I've worked for the RSPCA for over 30 years. I'm currently the head vet of Bolton at RSPCA. Um, each year, we think it's important to provide veterinary placements to undergraduates, and we take approximately 150 students a year. The two main aims that we have there is one is to expose students to, to charity practice, and in particular, the problems with cat overpopulation. And secondly, we want to give them exposure of, to prepubertal new trim. The key messages from tonight's talk, uh, uh, firstly, in terms of societal impact from prepubertal neutrin, it's the only game in town. As we've seen before, high rates of neutrin are not enough. It's the timing of neutrin. And prepubertal neutrin obviously is the optimal method of population control because it eliminates inadvertent or accidental pregnancies. So there's societal benefits from prepubertal neutrin. The individual patient, prepubertal neutrin has fewer complications than conventional. We don't have oddities like mammary development, pregnancy, fat patients. And for vets, and it's the important reason why I think Kate who will we'll chat later on, undergraduates can rapidly become proficient at this technique. Um, Kate's had a number of trips to Bolton RSPCA and she, she's a fantastic student. But even within the first week of seeing practice with us, she fully understood the importance of prepubertal neutron in terms of its welfare impact. And she rapidly became proficient at the technique. Um, my part in this talk is to talk about the anesthesia um, and how the technique evolved, because like many of many new vets, you're, you're initially concerned about the small physical size of your patients and whether they'll handle with the stress and strains of anesthesia. So we, we, we had a few thoughts as to what we thought might, might be a useful approach to anesthetizing these patients. So, for example, to mitigate some of the risks from hypothermia and hypo, hypoglycemia, we wanted a rapid induction phase. So we wanted re fairly potent agents. So, for example, we didn't think it was desirable to, to pre-med a kitten with ACP and then keep it an hour in a cage before we decided to do something. So we went for alpha 2s. Intramuscular is, is far more easy with uncooperative or physically small patients. Um, Reversibility, so agents to have antagonistic agents. For example, we can reverse metatomidine or we can reverse um, methadone with butorphanol or buprenorphine. These, these were important things on naloxone, for example. Body surface area is an important concept. If you were to routinely dose, for example, dogs, starting with small dogs, they tend to take quite a lot more per unit of size to anesthetize them to the same plane as something like a, a 15 kilo dog. And then larger dogs, when they receive a certain uh, body size per unit of kilo, um, they take longer to recover, recover. So we found that adapting our dosing regime to cover metabolic rates and body surface area dosing improved reliability. We, we wanted to use safe agents, so those that have wide therapeutic indexes, um, and that will be covered on the next slide. And again, Analgesia is very important for, for these small patients and multimodal was considered the most desirable approach. When we were considering which induction agent to use for early neutrin, we reviewed the, the properties and the dose range and the safety margins of the different agents. And for example, ketamine, you can use at 1.25 to 33 mg per kg through various routes, IV, IM, subcut, mucous membranes. It's a very um, broad, it has a broad range of effects at different dose ranges. Um, Alfaxalone, 
um, you can give it at five mg per kg IV and then give a similar dose later if there's no response. So, so you're looking at, a, 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 you know, you could probably double the dose without a, a great degree of concern. Propofol, again, looking at whether you use an alpha-2 or a non-alpha-2 or unpremedicated, we don't have the same wide range of, of dose ranges we, that we do for ketamine. Um, so because of its analgesic properties and its safety and its, its, its wide dose range, we, we chose to base our combinations on ketamine. The first paper that um, we, we published was, um, it was published in JFMS, uh, Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery in 2012. And that was using body surface area dosing with midazolam, metatomidine, and ketamine, and then a randomized non-steroidal, which was either carprofen or meloxicam, and a randomized opiate, which was either buprenorphine or butorphanol. All of the pain scores were low with the patients. For example, we used three scoring methods. One was a dynamic interactive visual analog scale. Uh, the other was a simple descriptive scale. And the MT part is a, a, a mechanical nociception. So we're using a, a pressure probe. Um, what we found with that uh, initial approach, there are no significant differences between the groups. So whether you, you, you use buprenorphine or butorphanol or either of the non-steroidals, all provided reliable analgesia for routine feline ovario hysterectomy. Um, that was a, a single experienced surgeon doing the study. Moving on from that study, um, we published a paper in 2014 in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery, where we looked at age and the reproductive status. Um, and what we found there using various pain scoring systems is that kittens had similar wound tenderness, i.e. a similar level of pressure discomfort, but less effective pain. So what I mean by that, they look considerably more perky, more interactive uh, and, and, and happier than their adult counterparts. Um, I was doing this work at Manchester Hospital. We had a large cat ward and you can visibly see the difference between um, kittens that were neutered alongside uh, their the adults, whether that was the, the queen of a litter or whether that was other adult cats later on in the list. Um, it, it's dramatic, the impact that you have. So if you're, if you're unfamiliar with doing neutering at various ages, if you compare and contrast the recoveries with a, with a kitten 30 minutes post-op where it's eating and wanting to play with litter mates versus an adult, which may be a little bit more d drowsy, for example, um, it, it's, it's dramatic, the effect. And, and so seeing firsthand the, these differences, I find is very persuasive, particularly when we're educating undergraduate vets. The next paper, um, um, we used, um, we were looking at the effects of metatomidine, dexmedetomidine, and atipamazole on recovery. So this was uh, a paper that was that was done in um, 2016 and was published in Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. So it was 100 cat castrations. We were interested in the difference between dexmed and metatomidine, um, reversal and unreversed. Um, the conclusion from this paper is, as you'd expect, atipamazole reliably reduced recovery time and recovery rates were faster in kittens. Um, so even when you look at body surface area dosing, where you're giving slightly more per unit of body size for a kitten, the recoveries are faster. The next paper uh, was uh, Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery 2019. Um, where we gave 120 cats, so they were assigned to two groups, one where they received the quad with methadone, the other where they received the quad with buprenorphine. Um, method, they, they were reversed at extubation with atipamazole. Um, rescue intervention was given methadone at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, um, 120 cats, and the strong conclusion was that methadone was superior. So um, we, we decided to use, or my preference would be to, to use uh, an anesthetic combination involving metatomidine, ketamine, and methadone. Um, and the midazolam now I no longer use, and I'll cover that with, with the next chart. People may be familiar with the Kitten Quad app. Um, it's available on the iPhone. Um, what, what you can do with this app is you can key in the body mass, um, the, the weight of a patient, and then you select whether you want to use buprenorphine or methadone quad. Um, so the quad is metatomidine, um, an opiate, midazolam and ketamine. If you choose the buprenorphine quad, you're using slightly higher volumes of each agent. Um, with what you can also use this app for is if you continue to use 
um, if you want to use the metatomidine methadone ketamine triple and exclude midazolam, you simply use the buprenorphine dose rate. That will be more clear on the next slide. So, for example, I, I can describe four anesthetic techniques that you use in various agents. So on the left hand side, we've got a column that, that indicates um, body weight. Then we've got body surface area dosing with four different combinations. So the kitten quad with buprenorphine is the first is the first column to the right of the of the mass. Then you've got the methadone quad. So these are both of these 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 quads are metatomidine, midazolam, ketamine, and an opiate. So you'll see because methadone is a, a pure mu agonist, it, it allows you to lower the dose of the the other agents in the quad. Then the next column is the metatomidine, methadone, ketamine triple, but the volumes, as you'll see, are the same as for the kitten quad with buprenorphine. So because we're excluding midazolam, we, can use a, we need to use a higher dose of metatomidine, methadone, and ketamine to achieve our anesthesia. And the fourth column is another option. If you choose to just use metatomidine and methadone and mask induce the patient so that you can reverse them and have a, a really prompt recovery, that is, that's the, the fourth column. So, um, the, most of the volumes used are the same as those on the buprenorphine quad. Only when you're using the methadone quad do you need to lower your volumes. I'm perfectly comfortable to respond to, to email questions about that. So as a working example, if we have a one kilogram kitten and we're choosing to use metatomidine, ketamine and methadone, it will get 0.06 mils of each agent simultaneously intramuscular and I prefer the quads muscle. After approximately five minutes, the patient will be, um, you'll be able to open its mouth, spray its larynx and intubate. Um, and something like a one kilogram kitten, I would probably use a three and a half millimeter non-cuff tube. And I think the bit that will give you greatest confidence is the fact that you can maintain the cat on 1% isoflurane, 100% oxygen for a, a, a one hour without difficulty. So um, a student spay of an hour, you've got the confidence that with the triple and isoflurane, you can keep them asleep for that time without an, any difficulty. And at the end of surgery, I reverse using 0 0.02 mils, a flat volume of atipam subcutaneously at the end of surgery. The reason I go for a flat dose rate is twofold. One, if the surgery has been quite long, some of the original metatomidine will have been metabolized. So I don't want a, t a cat to wake up hyperesthetic from unopposed ketamine. So I, I would prefer um, um, giving a lower volume. And I also give subcutaneous atopamazole because I've used a peripheral vasoconstrictor in metatomidine. So if I am reversing subcutaneously, I've got very slow and gradual absorption of the atopamazole from that site. So again, it's a, a way of mitigating against uh, post-emergence delirium and excitation on recovery. Um, at this point, the, the, the cute kitten picture tells me to hand over to Kate. Yeah, cute kittens, that's my cue. Um, thank you, David. So I'm here this evening to talk you through the surgical approach to either an ovariectomy or ovarian hysterectomy in kittens. And I'm here very much as a final year student at Nottingham University. Everything that I've learned to this point, I've either been taught by my university teachers or by the fantastic team at Bolton RSPCA, um, especially David. So basically the message here is if I can do this, anyone can. So hopefully after I have talked you through this procedure, um, I'm going to talk you through the way that I learned it. Then as a student or as a new grad, ideally you will feel more confident to take this into the workplace or perhaps as a very experienced vet, which I'm sure many of you are, you may have a slightly more insight as to how we feel as students and the way that you can sell this to us, if you like, to try and make us feel a bit more confident. So in terms of the approach, I broke this down into what I thought of as five chapters, um, which I would work through systematically. Now, the first chapter is preparation for the midline approach. Now, particularly in a kitten, it is especially important that you empty the bladder. We want to create as much space as possible to work in, and we also want to reduce the risk of any contact with that bladder um, uh, obviously during surgery, we're gonna be working in close proximity to it. So I'd really recommend making sure that the bladder is emptied. 
The location of the incision is slightly different on a prepubertal kitten to where it would be on an adult. It's slightly more caudal. So I look to go halfway to two thirds of the distance caudal from, between the umbilicus and the pubic brim. Once I've done the incision, I'm gonna move on to talking in detail about the part that most of us students and inexperienced vets dread, and that is finding the uterus. This is the most potentially unpredictable part that can add a huge amount of time to our surgery. So I'm gonna talk about how we deal with um, the mental fat, the bladder and the colon in particular um, to help us achieve this as quickly as possible. Then once we have the uterus in our hands, I'm gonna discuss how we elevate the ovary, the options that we've got for ovariectomy or ovariohysterectomy and what may influence our decision. And then finally the closure. And as you can see on this video here that we've just got playing, this is our case kitten in question. And all the video clips that I'm going to play for you today show myself operating on her. Um, and you will see that she's gone from a bright, happy kitten at the start about 30 minutes later, she's happily back in her kennel and eating a very well-deserved breakfast. So onwards, first slide, we're looking at our incision. So if we can just play this as I'm talking, I'll talk you through, I'm holding the skin taut and you can see there with the scalpel blade, my incision is about a centimeter and that should be plenty of space for me to be able to look inside the abdomen and locate the uterus. There's a very small amount of subcutaneous fat that I've just blunt dissected through there. So I'm not having to use lots of manipulation. I'm not having to dodge blood vessels that are crisscrossing that midline. There's no mammary development. So it's a very shallow incision. And very quickly, you can see here, I'm through to the muscle layer. As a student, I love a really clear landmark. And what is fantastic about neutering such young kittens is the linear alba is really clear. Even there, you can see it as I'm holding that linear alba up, I can do a stab incision with my blade and feel very confident that that stab incision is in the correct place. I then use my scissors with the tip angled up to extend that incision. Again, I'm looking for about a centimeter to line it up with my skin incision. So to summarize, at this stage already, there are huge benefits to operating on such a young kitten. There are far fewer blood vessels. I'm not having to dodge around them with my scalpel blade. There's less mammary development. I'm not having to blunt dissect down between developed mammary glands. There is very little subcutaneous fat. And I love that really, really clear linear alba that just reassures me that I've got my incision in the right place. So next up, finding the uterus. This is the part that when you are learning to do a surgery, it can add one minute to your surgery or it can add 20 minutes to your surgery. So as you're looking at the screen on the left, David is locating the uterus on a slightly older cat. And you can see there are a few more blood vessels involved there. He is using two sets of forceps, two, sorry, two sets of forceps. He is pushing the bladder cordially and the intestines cranially to create a window. We can then look down through this window and we should see the uterus sitting on top of the colon. Now, the video on the right, you can see there where it's still, I've located the uterus in a kitten. And the main difference I would say in a kitten is that there is so little intra-abdominal fat. In a, a full grown cat, it's a nightmare when you're trying to move your bladder back, your intestines forward, and this fat just keeps falling in the wound, hiding the uterus from your view. In a kitten, it's really easy to move these structures out of the way. They then stay there and you can see your uterus. Also in that video, I don't know if you noticed, but I actually dropped the uterus. And as a student, if this was an adult cat and I'd spent 20 minutes finding the uterus, just to then accidentally let it slip through my fingers and disappear back into the abyss, absolute nightmare. In a kitten, this is a very forgiving surgery. So yes, as, as will happen, I have made a slight mistake here, but I can easily recover it. All of the um, blood vessels are where I expect them to be. The size and the consistency of the uterus is very clearly different to small intestine. Whereas personally, maybe it's just me, but in an older cat, I find it quite difficult at times to distinguish between the small intestine 
and the uterus. In a prepubertal cat, they are very, very clearly different. So there's much less risk of you accidentally um, identifying the wrong structure. And that brings with it the benefit of much less tissue handling and a much quicker surgery for the kitten. So next section, once I've found my uterus, I'm going to look at removing my ovary. I'm going to gently walk my fingers along the uterus until the ovary is elevated and I have some good exposure from the body wall. I'm going to use my first clamp to fenestrate between the round ligament and the vessels of the uterus. And I'm going to apply three or four clamps. And I'll talk you through the different technique there in a second. My ligature goes into the bottom crush and then I'm going to use my scalpel blade to cut between the top two crushes. To check um, how tight my ligature is, I can hold on to that ovarian pedicle before I then rotate it and return it beneath the body wall. In terms of benefits, there are lots of benefits to this step as well. There's far less likely to be any pathology. So it's incredibly unlikely that in a prepubertal kitten, I'm going to have to extend my incision um, in order to elevate an ovary with a huge cyst on it. It's also incredibly unlikely that this kitten is going to be pregnant. Again, something that would lead me to need to extend my incision and handle much more tissue. The blood vessels are smaller. Again, that common theme of the predictable anatomy and the very stretchy ligaments. So on this next slide, um, this is just um, a real-time uh, continuation of the videos that you've already seen on our case kitten. I'm just walking my fingers up the uterus there and creating that fenestration. So in terms of time, it is highly realistic for a fifth year student or a new grad to be doing this procedure within 12 minutes. And I've just included on this slide some kind of key time points. So within a minute, the incision can be complete. 10 seconds later, you found the uterus because it's right there. You can then elevate your uterine horn and have your first clamp on the suspensory ligament within one and a half minutes of the start of surgery. You can see here, I'm placing my first ligature and I put it into the bottom crush. So I just lay it gently across my first clamp and then I'm holding it in position and sliding out that bottom clamp, minimal movement on the other clamps to make sure I don't compromise that tissue. I'm then going to add additional throws on top of that ligature to make sure it's tied really tightly. Again, with it being a kitten, this is not a friable structure. I can apply quite a lot of tension on this ligature and feel confident that I'm gonna be squeezing the structures and occluding the blood vessels as opposed to shearing through them, which is much more of a risk in an older cat. Um, particularly, you'll see again, when we come to the part where we're tying off the uterus later. So once I've tied my ligature, I'm just going to cut these ends really short. You'll see that in a second. Oh, there we go. Again, another perfect example, a little slip, but it's very forgiving where these structures are quite stretchy. And as I said, I'm gonna tie, uh, cut them really short. And then the next step is going to be to just shear between the top two clamps. And then that will release my first ovary from the suspensory ligament. So there, I've just sheared between them, reflected it back, and then I've rotated and lowered that ovarian pedicle underneath the body wall. So what I'm doing now is that I'm fanning out the broad ligament to identify the round ligament. I like to break the round ligament down using clamps. Again, as a student, I like things to be repeatable, consistent and controlled. And so for me, I prefer to use two clamps, twist and pull to break down that round ligament. And now the round ligament is gone. You can see I can exteriorize the bifurcation. I can gently walk my fingers up the other uterine horn to expose the second ovary. And what's really great here is where everything is so flexible in a kitten, I can get fantastic exposure on those ovaries. I can use the other fingers to push the body wall down and feel really confident that I'm not leave, leave, uh, sorry, leaving any ovarian tissue behind. So again here, this is my three clamp technique that David taught me. So three clamps on the suspensory ligament, my ligature is going to go underneath to begin with, under the camp clamps, through the window that I created with my first clamp, and I'm going to gently tie into the bottom crush. So at this point, we're on about five minutes 
and we're approaching a stage at which both ovaries have essentially um, been dealt with, um, which is obviously a really quick surgery time and going to be so much better for this patient. So here I'm just tying off this ligature. Again, I can apply plenty of tension because all the structures are really pliable, really stretchy. And then I'm just going to cut this one really short again. If I want to, I could hold the ovarian pedicle with one set of forceps to check that there's not a bleed. Um, but again, a huge benefit is so much smaller blood vessels on kittens as opposed to the vessels that we'll be dealing with on adult cats. So here we're coming up to about six minutes now. Uh, choice of suture material, good question. Um, controversial, we do choose to use um, cat gut. Um, I love it as a student because I can get a feel for the tension. I like that it does bite into itself. Um, you'll see here I'm using surgical knots. If I was using PDS, I would go for modified millers um, just to make sure it holds slightly tighter. So at this stage, we can see I've exteriorized both ovaries. The suspensory ligaments are both um, have both been ligated and cut through. This is just the second round ligament that I'm breaking through again using that two clamp technique, which I feel is a lot more controlled. If there were blood vessels in the broad ligament, as is the case with older cats, I could use that second clamp to tie an extra ligature into just to stem any additional bleedings. But in a cat this young, it's incredibly rare that I would need to do that. So we can see again, with everything being so stretchy, I've got a really good exposure here of the bifurcation of the uterus. And we can see how that one centimetre incision was plenty big enough to exteriorise everything that I needed to, to be able to visualise all of my structures and perform this surgery safely. My first ligature is going onto the uterus. This is about seven minutes now since the start of the surgery. In an older cat, this could be a really risky part of the surgery. For me as a student, this would be making me nervous because there'd be great big blood vessels there and potentially a very friable uterus um, from having previous litters. The joy of working again with this prepubertal kitten is the blood vessels are small. I'm not going to shear straight through the uterus with my ligature material. So you can see here again, I'm applying quite a lot of tension to make sure I'm occluding those blood vessels and I can cut those ends really short. I do like to put a second ligature on at this stage. So again, with the plenty of exposure, I can still get two more clamps well below the bifurcation and I'm going to tie my second ligature into a clamp at this stage, just so I can get it that tiny bit tighter and be absolutely certain. Again, being an inexperienced surgeon, I would rather do a little more than necessary than a little bit less. So again, here, same technique, just tying it in so it's gently laying across that bottom crush. Then I'm going to slide the bottom crush out. There we go, and just pull that ligature really, really tight. And I can see, I can watch it blanching into the blood vessels and make sure that I've occluded those really well. So again, using cat gut as we are, I'm gonna go three or four throws on top, plenty of tension. And then I'm gonna cut those ends really, really short. I'm going to reapply my second clamp above that first one just to give me a guide. So I'm then going to always cut between two clamps. So really the idea of showing you this in real time is just to demonstrate this is, this is not difficult. Um, I came to this profession not with any kind of surgical background at all. This is everything that I have learned from the University of Nottingham and from Bolton RSPCA. This is not a difficult procedure and it is a really, really quick procedure. So, at this stage, you can see I've got a very small incision that I need to close. Again, as a student, suturing can be really quite a stressful part of any surgery. And having such a small incision, again, reduces the amount of time. And it's also reducing the amount of suture material that I'm having to put into this kitten. So it takes me probably about two minutes to close. I use a three layer closure. And um, here you can see I've just gone through the muscle layer, making sure I include the sheath. And then after that, I'll just go for a subcutaneous layer and then intradermals to finish. Um, and yeah, we've had really, really good results with wound healing. So next slide. Um, this is just an example from David. So I'm just going to let him talk you through this. 
is the cat's right, so I'm pulling cord over me, lifting up, using my finger to fan out the uterus. You can see round ligament, round ligaments on this lateral aspect. Yeah. Penetrating between the round and the vessels of the uterus, putting the farcet on and pushing down. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me here is there's the suspensory ligament which I've not broken. There's a vessel right alongside mm. it. And this one I'll blanch back up to the ovary. So I think you can see there, David, um, this is another option, another technique that we could use. Um, he applies four clamps to the suspensory ligament because that means he can then shear between the top two clamps and reflect the ovary back, which means the suture material isn't needing to be passed through a window. So this is just to demonstrate that even within such a straightforward, simple procedure, there are aspects of personal preference. Um, and whichever you choose to use, whichever you're more comfortable with, is obviously what's likely to be more successful. So moving on from that, um, I just wanted to touch briefly on the difference between the ovariectomy and ovariohysterectomy procedure. Um, so for an ovariectomy, um, that means we are literally just removing the ovaries. You would apply three clamps to the proper ligament in the same technique as I showed you in the video that I use for the suspensory ligament with the three clamps above the ovary. For an ovariohysterectomy, obviously that involves removing the uterus as well. So you're going to need to expose the bifurcation and ideally ligate below the cervix. You can use your first ligature without clamps and then apply clamps for your second one. Now, in terms of deciding which one of these is going to be best for our patients, that decision is normally based largely around their individual differences and in anatomy. Generally speaking, an ovariectomy would be an advantage if the uterus is friable, if there's huge blood vessels there that we just really don't want to be going near, whereas an ov ovariohysterectomy is going to be preferable if, there is, uh, if there's pathology within the uterus that means it's simply not safe and not ideal to be leaving it behind. So things like cysts and pregnancy. Now, the beauty of performing this procedure in a kitten or another one of the many benefits is that neither of those aspects really apply. We're not going to be seeing um, pregnancies, pathologies, friable uteruses. So the surgeon really can go with their personal preference. My preference is to perform an ovariohysterectomy just because I prefer to remove any tissue that I have handled. But I think, you know, from what I understand and from what I've seen in practice, it is perfectly acceptable to do an ovario, uh, ovariectomy if that is what the surgeon prefers. So um, closure, I think I touched on this already. It's a three layer closure, very small incision. So it's super quick and hardly any suture material. And I think this video demonstrates perfectly um, our little subject kitten as she was waking up. This is not a stormy recovery. Um, I know David's spoken through the anesthetic protocols. And one thing that as a student, I was a little fearful of was this idea that ketamine can give quite a stormy recovery in cats. Um, and I think you can really see here, this is about 30 minutes after induction. She's waking up, she's bright, she's alert. This is not a stormy recovery. And the beauty of that means that we can get her fed really quickly. So hypoglycemia, of course, is something that we worry about in our younger patients. Um, we want to get them fed as quickly as possible. And knowing that they can be induced to recovery within 30 minutes is always gonna be a huge benefit to them. So uh, finally, I think this really sums it up for me. What would you rather remove? So you can see here in this central picture, we've got a uterus removed from our subject kitten, and then we have got a uterus removed from an older cat. And we can see really clearly the difference in terms of the amount of vasculature. To the left of the screen, we do have a pregnant spay, um, and underneath, again, a mature cat 
with much more um, vasculature. Um, obviously, that's going to need um, more, uh, a slightly larger incision. It's going to be more high risk of bleeds. And then to the right on your screen, you can see we've got an ovarian cyst. So again, something that might mean we need to extend our incision. So for me, really, the key messages here is that this is a quicker procedure. And this, as far as everything I've seen and experienced, this is a safer procedure and just a preferable um, procedure for such a young cat to go through. Um, they bounce back really quickly. It's much more predictable in terms of what you're going to be dealing with as the surgeon. And I would highly recommend anyone to seriously consider um, using this as part of their standard protocol in practice. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, in 1982, uh, Banana Ram and Fun Boy 3 got together to, to produce a song called uh, It Ain't What You Do, It's the, the Time That You Do It. And I think whether you do flank or midline or you do ovariectomy or ovario hysterectomy, it's not so much what you do. It's great if you can do all of those combinations, all of those techniques, but it's the timing that, we, that matters to us. So bear that song in mind. It's, it's the time that we do it. As Ian said, if, if you're conventionally neutral, we, you know, we, we, a lot of pregnancies are escaping us. But anyway, this slide touches on the option of whether you choose to do midline or flank. Most UK vets still do left flank. Now, midline, as Kate's slides illustrated, we've got great exposure of the uterine body. We're teaching students as well at Bolton RSPCA. So if problems occur, it, you know, it's easy to fix that from midline. In, non, in post pubertal cats, again, we can address pregnancy. And if we get some strange anatomical defects, for example, when we're doing multi-cat work, where we're looking at a, a household where there's 30 cats that are highly inbred, we see strange things like unicorn uteri. So if you were trying to fix those from a, a left flank approach, you may have difficulty. So I prefer and I teach midline because students can then use that as a development tool towards working towards bitch space. You can fix problems. And when you're working in charity practice, it solves some of these strange cases that you may come across. Being able to do midline it has advantages in terms of your pure breeds as well. It won't alter the coat. Um, you, the, the pain is an interesting point. When we're doing a midline approach, Kate, Kate will always hit the midline now with a prepubal or with a, a midline approach. Um, and it's a single fibrous layer that heals by in a fibrous manner. When we compare that with the, the flank approach, we're wading through thicker skin layers, fat layers, and a number of muscle layers. So the pain I feel, and, and some studies will show, um, is greater on a flank approach. I think the difficulty with studies where we're comparing the two techniques is most surgeons have a preference most surgeons are pretty slick on one technique, so it's not really always a fair comparison. Um, so midline, again, you may want to uh, avoid that if there's significant mammary development. Comparing that with the, the flank exposure, you get great exposure to the left ovary from a flank approach, but it's not the left one that's the tricky one to pull up. The right one is the one that has the tighter suspensory ligament. And again, I reiterate that if you have problems with a left flank approach, you're going to go to midline and that's going to look strange to an owner. If you start a left flank spay, have problems and then have to flip the cat over and open up midline, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, so for me, when we're, when we're learning as new or recent grads, we want to start with a, a technique that gives, them, gives us the optimum chance of success and will allow us to fix some of the problems that we may experience early on in our careers. Both of rapid surgeries, you, I can still do a flank spay quicker than I can do a midline. Um, and the, the difficulty with some of the flank technique is, is if you get not so much in pre-pubertal, as Kate says, but in post-pubertal cases, if you've got pregnancy, pyometric or obese cases, it's going to be a far more challenging surgery. But again, what I'd reiterate, it doesn't matter to me whether we do flank or midline. I think for undergraduates or new or recent grads, midline is the safest option. But for me, it's the volume of neuters that we do at the particular time. So it ain't what we do. It's the time that we do it. Um, one interesting aspect of, of the anesthesia, surgery and post-op analgesia is, is whether there's a need to do blanket non-steroidals for young patients. This study uh, we published in uh, this year in the veterinary record. We did the metatomidine um, methadone mask induction, uh, spayed the cats. It was both um, students and experienced vets doing the surgery. Um, we gave a, a randomised non-steroidal with either meloxicam or rabenicoxib. 
and we, we used the owners to assess post-operative pain up to 72 hours. The, the, the conclusion that we got from the study was that only 7% of owners would give their cats additional analgesia during the 72 hour window. So um, I, I know whenever we're doing this kind of presentation, people always touch on the value or the risks associated with oral non-steroidals. When we did this study, our preference was to offer the, the client a free post-op intervention, a free pre post-op check if they considered that the cat had problems or pain or discomfort post-operatively. That would be my preferred option rather than dishing out high volume oral non-steroidals. And especially in charity practice where you could argue that maybe owner compliance may not be optimal in terms of the accuracy of dosing of some of these quite difficult agents. So um, this is just a, 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 a challenge really that um, to, 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 to throw down to people. If you're doing this surgery, consider a blanket approach versus an individualized approach where one saves, um, you know, it has cost implications and environmental implications to, to routinely dish out non-steroidals. My preference would be to see patients the next day if need be. But again, um, on, on some of the studies that we've shown before, if you're using multimodal analgesia, metatomidine, methadone, ketamine, um, an opiate and a non-steroidal, we, we've, we're very comfortable with the level of, of, of pain and, and the behavioral scores that these patients get, particularly pre-pubital, post-operatively. Fantastic, thank you both. Um, and thank you, Jenny, as well. Um, Hey, I know you're just a student. You seem to be a very competent student to me. Or oh, that is David, an incredibly good teacher. I'm sure it's both. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm saying I'm, I'm up, I must have done thousands of cat plays, and I've done them mostly flank, but actually you made it look so easy. Um, and um, anyway, on to some questions, because I know you've already answered um, one of the main themes of the question was flank versus midline. So I won't dwell on that, but I do know that Many people are so used to doing flank that probably what we would suggest really, and David can come in if I'm wrong here, is if that's what you're used to, then I would suggest continuing to do that. Um, but maybe give the midline a, a, a go because it, it does look from, from that slide that David showed, there are some significant advantages to that. So um, might well, well be worth a go, um, particularly with these wee ones. Um, Dave, I just wonder if there's a few questions that have come up and a few that occur to me that I think would be worth answering. Um, how young would you go um, with this? Um, what age would you go down to for spaying a kitten? Um, thanks, Ian. So I've operated on kittens as small as 300 grams. So when we're doing feral work and somebody traps or, or, or gets hold of a, a queen and kittens, um, I, I would do them all on admission so um for feral work lower age limit isn't a problem you know 300 grams they, they they it's the same body surface area dosing you appear to be giving large volumes but their recoveries are fantastic so for feral work once i've trapped a cat or kitten it's going to be neutered irrespective of age and you know it's it, it's very safe stray work again um i would do any age of kitten because vaccination status isn't a concern um, for owned animals, our preference would be to have the animals vaccinated before they came into our clinic. So, um, yeah, I, age, is, as age isn't a barrier. So um, four months, if we can get below four months, great. But, you know, don't be, deter, you know, don't be dissuaded from, from doing feral work at very young ages. That's, that's, that's great. Um, a few more things, really. Some of the technical stuff. You, we, um, how long would you fast one of these kittens for? Fasting, again, is, a, is another interesting topic. Um, I, I, they're a lot more resilient to the, the, the hypoglycemic effects than we imagine. So, for example, when we give alpha-2s, we cause a hyperglycemia. So alpha-2s will elevate the glucose. So I think as, as from Kate's slide, we've got a rapid induction, we've got a rapid surgery, and we're giving routine reversal at completion of surgery. And I would expect the patient to be eating 30 minutes after surgery. In terms of fasting preoperatively and the risk of reflux, um, we, the, 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 we would probably, the, you know, if they're fed, for example, if, if, um, if, if they come in in the morning, they'd be first on the ops list. So we've not got, for example, a long overnight fast and then a day in, in the surgery. We, they would be first on the ops list and they'd be the first to be sent home. So um, 
heart, gastric half um, half life for emptying is about five hours, so it's longer than we imagine. But even with a three or four hour fast, that's 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 sufficient. We would keep brilliant. we would give them water right up until surgery, though. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Um, now, obviously, people have a wide range of experience of using different anaesthetic regimes. Um, what would you recommend if they don't currently have ketamine and or methadone in their practice? What would you recommend they do? If you've not got ketamine or methadone, what you could try is um, metatomidine and buprenorphine and mask induction. Yeah. Because I think if you're concerned about recoveries, um, so it, do, do, has somebody put forward what they use now? Yes, I think um, some, somebody suggesting using propofol, but it sounds to me like you'd probably prefer mask induction rather than trying to use pro, propofol. Yes, I think if you're you want to avoid a lengthy pre-med phase, so if their choice is um, ACP and then a lengthy uh, pre-med phase, that would call, that would increase the risk of hypothermia and hypoglycemia. And then when you, if you're using a pre-med, you've you've got um, quite a narrow therapeutic index for propofol. So uh, with a small a physically small patient, small veins. Um, I, I, that wouldn't be my preference. Um, what I will say is when we're to, doing student teaching and we've got a lot of students that have seen propofol inductions, not so much in pre but in adult cats, they're amazed at how simple our approach is. Um, weighing, body surface area dosing, and how quickly you can secure the airway. So, yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I think the downside of pro, propofol for me is its therapeutic index is nowhere near that of ketamine. Um, and when your body surface area dose, and I think you saw from the earlier slide, you, you, you can go from something like one and a bit milligrams per kilogram to, to you know, six or seven with, with propofol. I wouldn't fancy doing that necessarily with, um, with small patients. Um, yeah, I, that, that, so my preference would be metatomidine, buprenorphine, mask induction, and, 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 you know, and, and then reversal yeah. Yeah. If, if methadone wasn't available. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Obviously, some people feel uncomfortable with mask induction. Um, where I think um, you and I, I think both would be the same. We would always generally recommend, um, if we can, to intubate um, female cats, um, particularly, um, um, especially if the surgery isn't going to be isn't going to be as short as twelve minutes. Would you Would you concur with that, David? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think to not intubate a female is is strange practice nowadays in the uk yeah that's fine um, so i think we should always expect to have them on oxygen um, and it also then allows us to use um isofluorine or sevofluorine if that's what we've got if we need to um just prolong the anesthesia uh, an anesthesia a bit doesn't it um a few other questions um there's a bit about cat gut and other suture materials i presume if people are using used to using cat gut for ligatures that's perfectly okay um obviously i I don't think either you or I would recommend using them in, in to suture wounds uh, nowadays in cats. Um, what would you say? Absolutely. Um, the point about cat gut for me, I don't use cat gut in charity practice for cost saving. I use it because I find it very reliable for ligation. I would not use it at all for wound closure. Um, if I if I, if cat gut wasn't available, I would use PDS. And as Kate said, I, I would do a Miller's knot for some of the some of the structures. Um, another question, Dave, about licensing or otherwise of individual agents or combinations of agents. You know, we're, we're there talking about using meloxicam, which, you know, if you if you read the licensing, sometimes you're precluded from using it under a certain weight, for example. And some of the combinations of drugs that we're uh, talking about here are not um, they're not licensed use necessarily. Have you got any kind of just, just general comments on on how to approach this in practice? Because I know it can be a bit of a sticking point with some vets. Yeah, I, I think start with, you know, start from confident steps. So we're all very comfortable with alpha two opiate sedation and just build things up in a stepwise manner. So perhaps start doing cat castrations with med meth mask induction. Um, see how they reverse. 
um, I, I would find it very difficult to pain score cat castrations. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, whichever technique you use, they don't, they don't show pain or discomfort and build from that. Um, but I think in terms of your, if you're comfortable doing something to a, a post pubertal cat, we've got the safety of body surface area calculations. So what appears to be a, a, a safe dose for an adult cat is likely to be more safe for a kitten. If we look at human our human counterparts if we've got pediatric patients they require far greater doses of opiates than adults yeah so we have safety factors going smaller counter to what other what people believe i i think for, for me the, the purpose of this talk is 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 have a go when, when we're teaching students they're amazed at the recoveries with 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 the kittens um, we tr I try and cover uh, you know a few of the different combinations. And for example, if we get a late admission case, rather than cancelling it, we would probably do the metatomidine methadone mask induction and reverse it and send it home promptly, rather than keeping it in overnight. So there, there are, you know have a, have a dabble with these combinations. They're they're very safe. We've got and unlike um, we we have antagonists as well. So we can easily reverse metatomidine. We can use either naloxone if available or buprenorphine. Sorry, butorphanol to reverse methadone. Um, the advantage of using butorphanol is you still provide um, kappa analgesia um so i i think um i'd be very happy to correspond on individual questions about uh, you know the the anesthesia and analgesia um it you know it, it's um it's it's very reassuring to me that i i have two surgical tables on the go and i'll have two pairs of students um from day one covering our our, our new trim one will be doing anesthesia one will be doing the new trim which may take up to an hour and they're very comfortable with the simplicity of the induction the ease of intubation the reliability of, and the quality of anesthesia and the, the the smooth recoveries it's um yeah I, I think it's one to have a go of it there's such low volume agents that if you ordered a five mil bottle of any of these agents you could do a large number of cats and build up your confidence fairly cheaply and fairly swiftly brilliant no thank you um I think in the subject of methadone as well, I mean, from, from our experience, I would always say, look, give it give it a go. Don't be scared of using methadone in your practice. Yes, there's a little bit of extra paperwork, but it really is superior analgesia um, and definitely worth a go. Um, we're about to round up. I'm just going to ask, ask maybe an open question both to you, Jenny, and to you, Dave. Um, um, how about going having this conversation with, with uh, a cat owner? Um, how would you approach having the issue if they're a bit fixated on waiting, um, say until six months? How would you start having that conversation? What 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 steps would you recommend? How would you approach having that chat with them? Jenny, maybe if you want to start. Yeah, obviously I'm not a, a vet, so I can't give that real practical advice. And I would definitely direct people to CatKind where there is a video on there that will highlight the conversations that can be had. But I guess it's just probably helpful to highlight that we have done some preliminary research of cat owners. And it doesn't seem to be that that would be a, a, a big barrier for them. For a lot of them, they're just completely unaware that that's an option and so it just feels too too young um but they do say they would seek their vet's advice so that's when we go back to that we'll need to have those conversations with cat owners to have that consistency in um in preventative care for these cats and that those um, vets that do carry it out are actually saying really positive things about owner compliance um by nutrient at this age but yeah over to david who have more practical uh, tips maybe Thank you. What, what what we find particularly useful in charity practice is that when clients have first acquired a pet, they're very highly motivated to do the right thing. So we look at, at care as a package. So the most important things that they can do is obviously, you know, the, 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 the flea worm, uh, the vaccination. And we want them to have the first vaccine and then we'll combine the second vaccination and the microchip with the neuter operation. All of that accomplishes our key welfare objectives way before the four month window. So we we uh, we affordably price packages. Brilliant. Okay, that's a really good good suggestion, Dave. Um, well, thank you, um, all of you, Kate, Dave, Jenny. Um, that was really really informative, really helpful. Um, this this video will be made available. It's going to be on the ICAT uh, website at the very least. Um, um, but if you've if you've signed up for this, then I think we'll 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 easily be able to be in touch with you and let you know about that. Um, 
Um, and do as you say. I think David is very, very welcoming of, of any any email questions you might have, any further discussion you want to have about this. Um, as you can see, we're very passionate about this subject. Um, so just to close, really, you can see there on the information on the screen will direct you to our CatKind website. If you scan the QR code, that will take you straight through. Um, you'll find lots and lots of information there. Um, the reason we produced this webinar was just we thought we could package all of the really important, useful stuff into one place, because uh, we know not, not many people really like reading lots of information, but it is all there, including a lot more supportive material, um, including all those anesthetic protocols, the quitting, getting quad app, for example. Um, there's a team training pack there, and there's lots and lots of research. If you've got anybody cynical in practice who really needs persuaded, A, show them this video, but also um, send them to the website so they can get all the all the evidence that's there. Um, I know there's, there's sometimes an emotional component to this. It's not all about necessarily telling people the facts. They have to really believe it before they're going to change change their minds. But um, seeing that video, seeing how easy and straightforward it is, I think should should convince. Um, but try it. Um, um, you know, if if some of you you will be in practices where you've got very experienced surgeons. But getting vets to change the way they do things can be incredibly difficult, um, particularly if they've been in practice a long time. They've always done something a certain way. Um, but and, and although this 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 package here to, tonight, this webinar was really aimed at uh, grad, graduate vets and, and students, um, there's absolutely no reason that, that more senior vets shouldn't shouldn't have access to this. So please do encourage people to watch it. Um, just a final thanks to um, to all three of our speakers, but also a great thanks to um, Ellen and Nat on ICAP Care. Thank you so much for the support in producing this webinar. Um, thank you. It, it, it's really reassuring to have people that know what they're doing, something like this. Um, and uh, technically, it's worked really, really well. Um, and you'll all be pleased to have seen that I didn't have a, a power cut this time. <laughs> I disappeared from everybody's screens last night uh, um, during a massive big power cut, so that didn't happen tonight. So. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Hey, thanks very much, Ian.